So I wondered about Scotland, because Scotland is a famous area for geology. Of course, the weather is awful much of the time. So I was looking and thinking about Scotland, but everywhere it seemed to have been mapped, except out to the west there were some islands called the Outer Hebrides. And then I came across an article in New Scientist, not a very serious article, it was called The Geology of Whiskey Galore, which is a true story that happened in the latter part of the war, when on a Saturday night a ship with 25,000 cases of export scotch on board went aground between two of the Outer Hebrides. The guy who wrote it was called Peter Francis. He was a volcanologist lecturer at uh, the Open University. And he had worked on Barrett himself under Janet Ross. And he suggested humorously that because the rocks in the fault zone were a bit magnetic, that was how this ship full of whiskey went aground, which was, curiously, it was called the SS Politician. So for years, when I went out there, the islanders would say, ah, that was the year of the politician, but I couldn't figure out what it was about. I never got any of the whiskey, I might say. But that helped me choose my thesis area. And one thing I could mention that I think has changed to the detriment is that in those days, in geology at least, you were encouraged to define your own PhD topic. And you could get advice, and people could say, no, I don't think there's much could be got out of that. But you were the guy who defined it and refined it. These peculiar rocks produced by this fault zone, the so-called magnetic rocks, uh, included little squirts of black flinty material. And some of them, you could see, lay on small brittle fault planes. And you could call those fault veins. And others squirted off into the wall rocks for distances of up to a meter or so. Little injection squirts, like little dikelets, going off uh, the faults. And when you looked at them in thin section, you had to look at quite a lot, because many of them had recrystallized. But some of them had recognizable chill margins and little plagioclase microlites growing in them. And they'd obviously been through a melt phase. And that's a peculiar rock type called pseudotacolite. Tacolite being a volcanic glass. So these were like unto volcanic glasses, but were not. But pseudotacolites had been recognized on faults, and it had been suggested that perhaps they had something to do with earthquakes, because faults slip rapidly during an earthquake. And you can do a little back-of-envelope calculation that says, well, the minimum possible shear strength of a fault is of the same order as a seismic stress drop, which is about 10 megapascals. Seismologists tell us that faults slide at about a meter a second during an earthquake. If you multiply those numbers together, you're dissipating energy on the fault at 10 megawatts per square meter, which you can envisage because that's 10,000 one kilowatt bar heaters every square meter of the fault switched on for a period of a second or so during slip. If you look at the older literature, people like Harold Jeffries and others made statements, clearly all faults must be made of glass. And the interesting thing is that in fact they are not. Pseudotacolite is quite rare around faults. And so the big mystery came to be, why is this stuff so rare? So, I set to work on the Outer Hebrides thrust zone, which runs the whole length of the islands, but I focused mostly in the southern islands. I have to say that in the first field season, I resembled a headless chicken more than anything else. And it seems to me that that was a very important thing, that 
you need to get a bit lonely at times if you're doing original research. You don't know what you're doing, why you're measuring it. But the islanders were friendly and they were incredibly hospitable. So I had a very happy time there, even though the weather was miserable. But when it was good, it was wonderful.